Good evening all and welcome back. Before the video begins, I would like to give a huge thank you to everyone who helped with the Mort's Bedtime Stories app campaign. We raised all the funds we needed and I'm just really happy. Thank you to everyone who donated. Um, the app itself will be available for everyone else eventually, but right now we're just fine tuning it and stuff. So thank you guys. Tonight we're going to be heading into the deep sea beaches and other bodies of water for a collection of scary stories. So grab your blankets and get comfortable to let the ocean take control. Prior to joining the US Navy, my grandfather took me aside and told me several stories of his time spent in the Navy during World War II. It was his way of ensuring I knew what I was getting myself into. My grandfather was a weapons technician too, WT2, aboard the destroyer USS Maori DD-401 from 1942 to 1945 and manned a 538 caliber cannon. He survived Pearl Harbor, Battle over Tara, Battle of Midway, and the invasion of Luzon, to name a few with only a small shrapnel wound to his leg in all that time. I'd like to share of these stories, because they blow my mind. The date was August 21st, 1943. Location west-southwest of Nendo Island, Solomons. Ship, USS Maori, DD-401 destroyer. The Maori was escorting an HMAS Australian vessel to Espiritu Santo, as Japanese forces were still active in the area, and Allied forces were actively attempting to keep Guadalcanal and the Solomon secure after previous weeks of battle with Japanese forces. The night was clear, with every star in the sky. The wind was so low that you could hear gulls fishing off in the distance, and the waves splashing against the hull of the ships. The air felt like Hawaii in spring, and all you wanted to do was bask in the moonlight. When suddenly, voice radio communications from nearby allied island bases start chirping away with information about visual confirmation of enemy subs in the area to the north. Soon after, on all decks, orders were given and everyone was forced to stand ready. A team was assigned light patrol and they began panning around looking for subs. Not more than two hours go by with no visual contact made, and they're finally given the order to stand down and return to shut-eye duty. Before daybreak, contact from Nendo Island starts coming on voice comms, warning that potentials are flying around in the area five miles south of Mori's escort position. Already worried they may have been targeted by Japanese subs from below, they now have to contend with potential aerial assault, and everyone is called to stand ready once more. Engines are killed, emergency lights activated, and orders given to kill all lights. My grandfather manning his light is immediately ordered to put that candle out, and pushes the searchlight straight down into the water, turning it off. When they finally stopped moving, the crew can hear the low, tone humming of several planes passing parallel to their position. Everyone holds their breath and pretends to pretty much not exist, just hoping the enemy does not make visual contact with the ships. So for a good 45 minutes, everyone just sits there until they can no longer make audible contact with their enemy forces they hope would pass. Finally, Almost after two hours of nothing, they are given the go-ahead to start the engines and return to the passage. My grandfather flicks his cigarette port side and clicks on his searchlight, still pointing into the water. What he says he saw next aged him and the other two with him a good ten years. Below, where the searchlight sat focused in the water, lay an eyeball the size of a basketball sitting there staring straight back at him from about 10 feet underneath the water. 
the next three seconds lasted minutes in his mind, as he watched this silvery disc of an eye looked straight through him. The first of the engines started in what seemed like forever, and the beast that it was broke surface for a brief moment in order to dive deep. Even before people acknowledged the giant squid existed, before they were even caught on camera, my grandfather believed, because he had seen one within 20 feet of his face. In my eight years of service, I've heard many stories of such things, and even own a few teeth pulled from the rubber lining of the ship. But never have I had any of these experiences myself, adding that experience in lieu of the drama of war, and you can get a sense for the true terror it would invoke. My grandfather, now 93, is still alive and kicking. Even though his dementia is heavy, and he seems to live in the past, it's good to know that there are still some heroes in this world. For a couple of months last year, I lived in South Africa and did marine research with some of the people who made Shark Week. The work involved sailing out each morning, attracting sharks to the research vessel, about 21 feet with two engines, and then collecting data about them by various means. Going into this project, I had very little knowledge of marine biology, and as a result, I was usually relegated to the role of chummer. This lucky individual has the role of grinding up large quantities of rotting sardine heads and continuously pouring them off the side of the boat to attract white sharks. My experience took place on my first time chumming. It was a beautiful summer morning, and we had just set out to one of the primary research locations, a reef colloquially known as Shark City by the locals. The seas were unusually rough, and we were watching quite large waves hit the beach, about a third of a mile from where we had laid anchor. The process of grinding up the rotting fish involves the chum dance, standing in a rectangular container in a pair of rain boots. I was crushing the fishy remnants while dancing to Michael Jackson's Thriller, a favorite amongst the researchers. Just as the chum dance reached its finale, and a fair amount of rotting sardine was in the water, the crow's nest spotter hastily pointed to a white glimmer just a few feet to our starboard. We had gotten lucky. A 15-foot female great white had come to investigate the fishy carnage. Contrary to popular beliefs, white sharks don't circle boats near the surface with their fin above water. They are indeed ambush hunters, swimming in sporadic patterns around prey, diving to depths below sight, and then eventually striking in a rush from below. We researchers, me in particular, considering I had never seen a shark before, were giddy, as this large female made a few loops around the vessel before disappearing into the iron green abyss. About a minute later, as I was peering off the side, still standing in the chub container, I noticed that the jovial South African laughter behind me had abruptly stopped. I turned around to see a large wave, 10 to 15 feet coming in quickly on our starboard side. In the few seconds before adrenaline set in, I remember seeing the wall of water crashing over me, spinning and floating. I had been flung overboard by the freak wave. Dear friends, at this point in the story, you must consider who I was at the time. A jet-lagged, somewhat nerdy, skinny American teenage boy, outside of the US for the first time. There I was, floating in the South African Sea, a few thousand miles from home, in a cloud of rotting sardine matter. Oh yes, the chum container had been flung off the boat with me, with a 15-foot great white shark swimming probably a few yards below. I have very little memory of what happened next. My mind clouded by adrenaline. My salvation came in the form of a large arm that pulled me back aboard the boat, which luckily had not capsized. Oh, what joyous breath of salty ocean air I breathed then. I'll just say a few more words. I cannot think of a good thing that came out of this sharky episode. 
For one, it accelerated me getting to know the researchers, who presumably at the result of our mutual peril, welcomed me in with open arms for the rest of my time in Africa. The large shark, which is seen regularly to this day in Shark City, was named after me. This experience gives me the opportunity to share my obligatory PSAs to everyone I tell. Sharks are incredible creatures. They should be respected, admired, and protected. I'm not even going to tell you that they should be feared, as they definitely should to a healthy extent. However, when you consider how many people are killed each year in shark attacks, versus how many sharks are slaughtered for sport, trophies, or fins, you realize that we are indeed a far greater threat to them than they are to us. You may have heard it all before, but I think it's still worthy to say. I was working on a car carrier four years ago in the Middle East. Our typical route went through private waters at the time. And so, we always picked up four ex-Marines as security in Aqaba, Jordan, before we went. One night while we were going through pirate waters off Yemen, we started to have problems with the main engine. So we stopped and had to drift for a bit to figure out what the problem was. During this time I was working on the stern, back end of the vessel. I couldn't really see anything out in the ocean. Everything was dimly lit on the ship. I don't know why, but I got bored and turned on the spotlight. And there he was. This guy with a gun in a rusted little boat, staring at me about 15 feet from the ship. I just stared back at him, kind of stunned. I was afraid if I reached for the radio to call one of the marines, he'd shoot me. The marines were the ones with the weapons. So he looked at me, and I looked at him. And he sort of gave me a nod, as if he was telling me, Well played. And then I gave him one back. Then he slowly rowed his boat back off into the deep, pitch black night. I don't know how many others there were, but I did call it in on the radio as soon as I lost sight of him. I still remember his face today. A deep, stern, concentrated look on his face. For context, we're female. This happened back mid-February of 2020, and my friends and I were all 15. This takes place in Italy, on a school trip we were on. The trip itself was all right, but seeing as we were dumb teenagers, we decided to push boundaries. Our school had booked us into a pretty average hotel, low budget. So one night, two of my friends asked me if I wanted to sneak out with them during the night so that we could go to the nearby beach. I'm generally quite sensible, but they kept persuading me until I finally gave in. We would only get one opportunity to do this, right? So we waited until about 1 a.m., messaging each other when to leave the room and meet in the corridor. It was only three of us. We didn't want anyone else to know as they might snitch. Looking back on it now, this was probably a reckless decision, considering the events that would unfold in the next hours to come and how that night could have ended. The teachers were sleeping in the room opposite to ours, so we had to be so quiet as to not get caught. I can still remember how worried I was that we would be caught and they would ring my parents. If you couldn't tell already, I'm genuinely quite anxious, so I avoid rule breaking most of the time. This night was an obvious exception. We were successful though, and managed to sneak our way down to the lobby. For whatever reason, the front desk attendant wasn't there, so we'd hurry through the doors not wanting to get caught out. None of us actually knew any Italian, so this was possibly one of the dumbest things we could have done. We walked for about two miles down to the beach, all smug that we had actually managed to pull off the perfectly devised plan. The streets were empty, not surprising considering it was 1am, but it didn't stop that anxious feeling in the back of my mind. I knew that what we were doing would get us into so much trouble if caught. We had to walk down hundreds of steps in order to actually get to the beach. Plenty of time to reconsider our actions, but we were stupid and determined to keep going. Something I regret now. The beach was really quite beautiful. It was a full moon at night, and the beach was lit up in a beautiful soft light. 
we had the place to ourselves. We pissed around for about 10 minutes or so, and then my friend said they wanted to go into the sea. I was adamant that I wasn't, despite their protests, so they told me to keep an eye on their belongings. We had only really brought our jackets and phones. They rolled up their trousers and went knee deep into the sea. I started filming them and taking pictures. The others would be so jealous. I remember thinking that. Just wait until they see the pictures. They spent about five minutes frolicking in the cold sea before they came back to the beach and started stripping off more. I couldn't believe it. They were gonna go swimming. They had the genius idea to go in their underwear. I couldn't stop laughing at this point. Looking back at it now, I should have persuaded them not to, but I didn't understand the gravity of the situation we would soon be in. They both ran towards the waves and jumped in at the same time, screaming and giggling in the freezing water. I stood on the shore laughing and filming the whole thing. While guarding their things, I got the eerie feeling of being watched. I can only put it down to instinct. Naturally, I put my guard up and looked around. I'm so glad I did. Because God knows what would have happened if I hadn't have noticed them. Two men were sitting, about 30 meters from us in the dark. I can't be sure, as I only noticed them for a brief moment before turning back around. But it looked like one of the men was holding up his phone filming us. My stomach dropped. I called both my friends. They must have noticed the tone in my voice. I was shaken, despite my best efforts to be discreet. They walked up to the sand towards me, dripping wet and freezing cold. I told them two men were sitting behind us watching. I'd never seen them so scared. That's when the trepidation hit us. No one knew we were here. As far as everyone else knew, we were fast asleep in our hotel rooms. These men could easily take us down, abduct us, end our lives, something worse perhaps, and no one would ever know. I whispered to my friend that we needed to leave. I told them to not bother getting dressed, to just grab their stuff and leave as inconspicuously as possible. They agreed with no hesitation. At this point I was really worried. The men must have known that we saw them despite our best efforts. Nothing could conceal the raw fear we felt, and it showed on our faces. As we approached the steps, I made a quick glance behind her, and a sweat broke out on my forehead. The men were now slowly walking towards us. Fight or flight kicked in, and I shouted to my friends to run. Barefoot and soaked, they scrambled up the steps as quickly as they could, and we kept pushing. I didn't look behind me for fear of how close they could be. We didn't stop once we reached the stops or the steps onto the pavement. We kept running on pure adrenaline. Our legs burned. I looked down to see both of my friend's feet were bloody, but they didn't stop. I kept glancing behind us once we were on a stretch of pavement, but I didn't see the men, and I didn't know if they were still following us or not. That did nothing to ease my nerves, as we didn't stop running until the hotel was in sight. I turned around, and to my relief, I could not see the men. We walked through the entrance to the hotel. This time, however, there was a man at the front desk and started speaking to us in Italian. We didn't understand him, so we kept walking, my friends leaving bloody footprints through the lobby. Once we reached the corridor, we made a mutual vow to never tell anyone about that night, and we all went back to our rooms. The man at the front desk must have told our teachers that he saw us walking at 3 a.m. through his hotel lobby, leaving bloody footprints everywhere, because that warning I awoke to a loud banging on our door. Mrs. Smith was shouting at everyone, asking who it was that left last night. Of course, everyone was confused, and I didn't dare speak up, Neither did my friends. After several speeches made about the severity of our actions and how we were going to find out who it was, I was terrified. My two friends finally spoke up and admitted it was them. Thankfully, they left my name out of it, which I'll forever be grateful for. The teachers were furious, and as you can imagine, both my friends received phone calls home 
and they had to delete all pictures taken that night. The teachers wanted all evidence deleted, as it reflected badly on them because in their care, we did something so reckless. They were just concerned about not losing their jobs. My friends didn't argue, because they were still protecting my name and all, and didn't want the teachers actually asking for the photo, so they just obliged. I always think back on how that night could have ended, how horribly wrong it could have gone, and despite being one of the dumbest things I'd ever done, I'm glad I decided to go, because it terrifies me to think what would have happened to my two friends if I wasn't there to spot those men. When I was about six, my family went on vacation to the beach in Florida. I'm a lot younger than my siblings, so while they were doing their own thing with their friends, I was stuck wherever my mum would take me. For the most part, we stayed in the extremely crowded pool area by a hotel, which had direct access to the beach. It's all a bit hazy, but at some point when I was swimming, I looked up to where my mum was supposed to be sitting, and she wasn't there. I was really attached to her, so I got out and started looking for her. I scanned all the chairs, took a trip around the bar next to the pool, but I couldn't find her. For some reason, six-year-old me decided she'd gone for a walk on the beach without me. So, I made my way out there looking for her. I walked about half a mile down the beach, out onto the crowds to a more vacant area, and just remember that I started to cry, because I thought I'd never see my mum again. Just as I had basically given up, a woman and a man came up to me. They asked me who I was, if I had any family nearby, and I had told them I was alone, and looking for my mother. They said to me that they had seen my mother, and told me that they would hang out with me until she returned. Well, these people took me about two miles away from my hotel. We walked down the beach to a more residential area, and they kept insisting my mom was going to be down on the other end of the beach, and that they were going to take care of me. They tried to get me to build sandcastles with them, play in the water, and even told me that we could leave to go get dinner, and they'd bring me back after. I kept telling them no, I wanted to return to my hotel, so that I could go up to my room and check for my mum there. And that's when they got really upset with me. The woman said, We're going to leave to get dinner at our house, and we'll bring you back to your hotel afterwards, got it? I was starting to get really nervous, so I told them I didn't want to go with them, and that I could walk back to the hotel on my own. The man then said, And I'll never forget this, You're coming home with us for dinner. He said it in one of these creepy do-or-die tones. I don't know. It just stuck with me. Lucky for me, I heard my name in the distance. There was a group of people yelling for me, so I bolted over to them and they asked me who I was. I told them my name and they smiled so big and said, There are lots of people looking for you. When I turned around to tell the group that a man and woman had been hanging out with me, they were gone. The group, which actually ended up being hotel workers, took me back to the hotel where everyone was waiting. There was a fire truck, an ambulance, and a news crew, because I had been gone for over half the day. The entire pool area had been shut down in efforts to arrange search parties. My mother was sobbing, but all was okay. When I told the hotel workers what happened, they were extremely concerned. Apparently not even a week before, a child went missing in their beach access area. When the kid was found, he claimed a man and woman lured him out to their car, where they tried to forcibly take him home with them. And that's when he bolted away and found another family for help. I was almost next. This happened on a trip sanctioned by my former high school. We went to Russia and had a wonderful time in Moscow and St. Petersburg. The travel agency, in a bit to get more money, offered us an extension to Tallinn, Estonia, and Helsinki, Finland. Being school kids out of the United States, some of us for the first time, of course we took it. We took an uneventful trip on a bus to Estonia, and then a ship to cross the Baltic Sea into Finland. The trip leader decided we had been pretty damn responsible for the past week and a half, and told us we could sit and eat wherever we wanted, and told us where to find him. We had lunch on the ship, 
and that's when things turned creepy. A group of girls had claimed a table to themselves, and they were just chatting and eating. Then a man came up and spoke to them, in Russian. They apologized and said they could only speak English, and he left. Then he came back a few minutes later and sat at the table right next to them. After a few minutes of having him stare at them, they moved to a different table in a different part of the ship. A few minutes later, the same man appeared and sat right next to them again. Then one of them saw him take out a camera and snap a few pics of them. Having enough of this, the group set off to find a parent or teacher. They hit the jackpot, and most of the teachers and a few parents were sitting together, and they told them what was happening. The trip leader went off to find some employee on the ship to help us out, and the rest all came to the table of girls. Once the adults came crowding in, the man left. The girls all felt better, but stuck with the adults just to be safe. Then one girl, Mary, went to the bathroom. She knew another person was already in them, and she felt safe enough to go on her own. Then, on her way, she saw the same creepy man from before. She hurried past, outside the ladies' room and turned back. He was waiting for her at the end of the hall. She went into the bathroom and began hyperventilating. What she didn't know was that one of the dads followed her just to be on the safe side, and he saw her being followed. He brushed right past the creepy man and stood guard at the bathroom door, being sure to give the man a proper glare and he walked off in a hurry. Once he was gone, he knocked on the bathroom door and told her that he would wait for her, and it was safe to come out. The trip leader found someone who spoke English and told them what had happened, and they said that they would keep a lookout for the man and make sure he was stopped if he was caught leaving the ship. The story happened in the summer of 09. I spoke to the parent who stood guard in the bathroom a few years later, and he said he remembered the man was short, had a beard, and he ran off when the parents waved at a security camera and then pointed at him, if you wanted more context. But no one saw him again after that, so I assumed that he was caught somewhere or else he snuck off with his pictures of underaged girls. Creepy pervert. I circumnavigated the globe from the ages of 23 to 25 on a 43-foot sailboat. One of the freakiest incidents we had on board was when we were leaving Singapore in the middle of the night. Aside from the constant game of Frogger dodging freighters, our path was straightforward. About 3 a.m., I was alone at the helm, with everyone else asleep below. Suddenly, I hear a beep from the radar, which we had set to warn about anything within a quarter mile of our vessel. Looking round, I couldn't find anything obvious within that range so I put the boat on autopilot and went down to investigate. Typically, other ships show up as little blobs, but for some reason the radar was registering a long, solid line the length of the screen directly in front of us, and it was getting closer fast. Heart racing, I went back on deck to see what could possibly be registering such a bizarre signature. Eyes slowly adjusting. I looked into the dark, peering as hard as I could to make out something, anything, and then... I saw it. Not more than a hundred yards ahead was a 20 foot high, unlit, rock solid wall. Right there in the middle of the ocean, looming, and by this point making its presence known by the sound of waves lapping against it. I was absolutely petrified. Mind you, this was before chart plotters were widely used, and we were navigating with paper charts. I was utterly confused and supremely terrified. I called all hands on deck and we stopped the boat dead, pulled down the sails and started the engine. Slowly, painstakingly, we picked our way through what was by the time an increasingly apparent full-on construction zone. Our charts were only two years old, but apparently Singapore had undergone a monumental land reclamation project, or perhaps nuclamation, since it was never there to begin with. Even once we found our way out, no one slept for the rest of the night. To this day, the image of that magically appearing dark wall in the middle of the ocean haunts my dreams. I started kayaking a few weeks ago. Every Friday, my trainer Gabby and I would go kayaking on the Rhine River. And every other Monday, we have training, 
in an indoor swimming pool to improve our paddle techniques, getting out of the kayak underwater, or doing the Eskimo roll. Anyway, one Friday we got out onto the Rhine River, and like always we paddled our way to a little island that is under conservation. It sits pretty much in the middle of the river, and you're not allowed to go up there. When we paddled to the bank, we spotted a backpack in the water. Naturally, we questioned how it got there. I thought someone might have been trespassing on the island and lost it, or simply littered it, but Gabby mentioned that it was more likely to be stolen, and that the valuables had been taken and the backpack then discarded across the bridge, and that it floated here until it got stuck at the bank of the island. Because we were super curious, we retrieved it, which turned out to be heavy, because it had been soaked. We took a look inside and found a few charges, a pack of crisps, a Snickers, a notebook, calendar, and some paper that was no longer legible. We decided to take the backpack with us to inspect further. After putting all the kayak stuff away, we looked closer. Gabby found a set of keys, but we didn't see a phone or wallet, confirming Gabby's assumption that it had been stolen. I took the calendar to see if I could find any info about the previous owner, and even though it had been in the water for some time, you could still read most of the notes the man wrote down. We found quite a few appointments written down, and a confirmation of a doctor's appointment, which gave us the name of the owner. Gabby said that she would let the backpack dry, take it home and contact the doctor to let him know about finding his patient's belongings. I was unable to go kayaking next week as I was visiting my grandma, but the Monday after, we went back to training, and I wanted to ask Gabby if she had any update about the backpack, but due to traffic, she ran a bit late and I simply forgot about it. After training though, Gabby came up to me and told me that she needed to update me about the backpack story. It took me a moment to realize what she had said. The backpack owner had died. I wanted to know how she found out. Apparently she called his doctor and she said before wanting to call him, she had simply Googled the name and what she found out was a missing persons report. The police said that if anyone knew anything about the man, to speak to them directly, so she did. I asked how she knew he was dead, and she said when the police came back and retrieved the backpack, they handed her a form saying she would let them have the backpack of the deceased person. Gabby said that she felt sick after receiving the info that the guy was dead, and that she thinks he may have ended his life because we have seen so many doctor's appointments in the calendar. We wonder if the man drowned himself with a backpack or if he just threw it in the water so something personal of his would be found even if his remains weren't. That got me quite a bit. I had been struggling with mental illness myself and see myself as an overall empathetic person. So it was easy for me to see how the guy must have struggled. The despair he felt right before taking his own life, the void of his soul and absolute nothingness, the reason to live that he ran out of. If he had drowned himself, was it because the water gave him peace? Gabby and I still talk about it. He won't be forgotten by us. I hope from the bottom of my heart that he has now found the peace that he couldn't find while being alive. When I was around 10, my family took a trip to Egypt. It was sort of a half cruise down the Nile. We would stay often in various spots to check things out. I don't think we honestly travelled on the boat very far, but it's where our rooms were. My memory is a bit shaky on the finer points, as it was almost 20 years ago, but I do remember a lot of cool things we went to see and do there. The Great Pyramids, riding a camel, museums, mummies and the like. But I also remember a lot of not-so-fun things. Like the tour guide telling my family that my mother and I could never be by ourselves without either our male family members or others from the tour group. They told us that the men in the country would see a single woman as someone seeking doing it, as they wouldn't travel alone otherwise. Or when a man tried to offer my father a herd of camels in exchange for me, and a bit less for my mother, we were horrified. On top of that, the ship we were staying at had a swimming pool. One morning as I was using it, sporting a one-piece bathing suit, there was a boat driving past where we were moored, full of men. 
They were hooting, hollering and applauding, and making a general ruckus as they could see me. And I put on theatrics because of it, diving in the pool, strutting around, loving the attention. I cringe at this now. Years later, my mother told me how in a store selling souvenirs on the shore, she was groped by the seller. He was placing a necklace on her and gave one of her breasts a really invasive feel. She told my father when he shrugged it off, and she was still mad at him over it. I understand. I would be too. And to this day, I remember the one morning my parents went to go watch the sunrise over the desert. It required a very early wake-up, and my brother and I declined on going. So while my parents were out in the desert looking at the sun, my brother still sleeping, I decided to go to the pool. This may have been the same day that I was catcalled since I was in the pool area by myself, but I'm not 100% sure. I do remember that on the top of that ship, there was a hatch going down one level near the pool. That day I eyed it and decided I had to know where it went. It was easy to open and I climbed down a short ladder to the deck below. The deck was still open to the outside with doors leading to compartments and such. The way the boat was moored, we had a couple of ships out from the port. To get off the boat, you'd have to traverse the other ships in between. But I think this was a normal thing. We were all lined up together and the travellers would simply disembark by going through various ships until reaching shore. I went right when I reached the ladder bottom, noticing the major differences from the others around the boat I'd been on. The area was dirtier, and there were ropes and other junk lying around. I think that's where the kitchens were and I stood a while looking through the window. I remember it seemed rather gross looking in there, which redoubled my desire to never eat there. I went back towards where the ladder was, then continued for a bit. From this vantage I could see all the ships between ours and the shore, I think maybe four in total, and I noticed the far ship that a man was hopping over the railings and coming towards me, one boat at a time. This is versus coming through the main area, which had been set up for the tourists to easily get through all the ships to go to shore. I backed up a bit towards the ladder, and realised he was making a beeline towards me. He came over the railing and I don't remember what exactly he said to me, but it was an introduction in heavy, accented English. He asked me if I wanted to party. I was a little confused in my head, because party is where my parents had friends over, and there's lots of music and dancing. I liked parties. I don't remember exactly how he convinced me, but I remember standing in the open doorway to the cabin where he was inviting me in. It smelled like smoke, and there was still haze all throughout the room. Three men in traditional garb, like flowing dress shirts that they were wearing, were sitting around smiling, waving their hands at me, a hooker nearby, bottles everywhere. Outside the room, the sun was shining and everything was bright and lit up. There was an underlying smell I couldn't place, smoke drifting, and the blinds were shut, giving the room a reddish tinge. Out of everything, the memory that is most vivid is I remember looking up at the time to see a smiling, moustached man standing in the doorway. He wasn't intimidating, a bit scrawny in fact. My little prepubescent brain did light up though. I went, I'm pretty sure this is one of these situations I'm not supposed to be in, and I really need to get the hell out of here now. So I booked it, turned tail, and skedaddled to the ladder as it wasn't far. I didn't look back a single time, I just got to the ladder as fast as I could and ran back to our room that my brother was still in, still sleeping. I told my parents after they returned, and they made a complaint but nothing ever came of it. The room in question was just a crew member's lounge or something, but I never saw those guys again. My parents left Egypt disgruntled, I never really thought about it again until years later when I was older. Would I be dead by now? Sold into a trafficking ring? Married to some Egyptian guy with a bunch of kids? It makes me shudder to think about. And I'm grateful that my school did cover a little, although not enough, stranger danger. It was enough to make me reject the very friendly guy and realize it was a bad situation. With all the weird situations that happened on that trip, and the fascination I apparently held for being so young, I can't help but feel that something terrible would have happened if I'd have gone to that room. Some years ago when I was eight, 
my grandfather took me fishing in a little motorboat a couple of miles offshore in the Atlantic. After an hour with nothing caught, he started the return trip and turned the motor on. But no luck. After 15 minutes of effort, and cursing the likes of which I've never heard, he undid the clamp holding the motor on and dropped it to the bottom of the ocean. Then he started rowing back. He popped out a mile offshore, and we were being carried rapidly towards some exposed rocks. A large motor yacht approached. I started jumping up and down screaming. Gramps told me to sit down and shut up. Apparently the law of the sea meant that if you ask for help, the person giving aid can claim your boat. So we waited until they offered help and got towed in. We almost died because Gramps was willing to scuttle his motor, but not his boat. I was in Bermuda in the off-season, with my parents and little brother. I must have been about five. I remember the hotel was empty, and a man with a red vest shirt got me some milk. The beach was empty. Just so you know, most of this place was empty. Cheaper for us, perhaps, to go. I was on the beach with my parents, and my two to three-year-old brother was with them. I ran off to explore, and saw my mum on the beach. Come on, Nate! There was a thick area of scrubby bushes and trees along the beach. She went up to it. There was this cement square with pipes or vents or something coming out of it. She stood there, then saw me coming and kept walking into the thicket. I felt something was wrong, but didn't want to be defiant. So, I pretended I was really interested in the pipe thing and said out loud, I wonder what those are for. So if she got mad, I could say I was interested in the pipes or something and not just disobey. As soon as she went out of view into the thicket, my dad came up from the beach into where I was and yelled, What have you been doing? Don't wander off like that. He took my hand roughly and led me back to the beach where my mother and brother were. I still don't know what the hell happened. The woman looked exactly like my mum, but just felt... wrong. I'm from Bay of Couture and have a sailing boat which I ride with my family almost every day in summer. At one time around 8pm, we were in the middle of the bay sailing home. The thing was, the bay was surrounded by mountains, so it was pretty dark, even if it was 8pm. Out of nowhere, this big wave starts appearing right next to us, and they appeared to be the kind of waves that were made from a boat. However, there were no big boats near us. On the last wave, I accidentally look up and saw this big wooden sail, bigger than my entire boat. I instantly looked down and saw this huge 18th century boat. And the moment I looked at it, it faded from existence along with the waves. It doesn't sound that scary in retrospect, but when you're out on the deep sea and experience something like this, it would freak anyone out. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. So what do you think? Might start titling the videos Scary Stories to Fall Asleep to, something like that. Adding it into the title. Try and get on those searches. That, by the way, was Leonora's snore. Please ignore. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, of course a like and stuff would be superbly appreciated. I always really like that. And uh, what do you guys think of the black screen? Is it time to maybe add some visuals? I do get comments saying that you love the black screen. But um, what if I had like something dark on screen? Would that be too distracting? Anyway, let's, let's have a conversation about this. Let's have thoughts. I do value your guys' input. And thank you for everyone who joined me on the live streams. They were super fun to do. Uh, but yes, I'm just so happy for everyone, including the names on screen, to my members and patrons, and coffee supporters. And just, just thank, thank you, everyone who listens to me. It really means the world to me that I can keep make this content for you and that you stay interested. It, um, it's wonderful. Thank you. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.